So firstly, I'd like to um, start by acknowledging, acknowledging that we are here today on Gumbangi country and um, to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And um, I think that, you know, we have in Gumbangi country, we have a really rich history of both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal of looking after each other. So I think that's a really great um, space to remember as we come together to talk about making sure everyone's got a safe home, a safe and appropriate home. I'm going to talk about accessible housing. Um, what does it mean? I'm not talking about financially accessible generally, and I think that's been there's been a lot of discussion about financially accessible. Um, what does it mean? Why is it important, and how do we get it? And we've actually heard from a lot of speakers about how we how we get more housing generally, and um, and and housing for vulnerable people, which is a particular passion of mine. What is it? So I've seen a slightly different definition of what universal design is, but you know, the rough concept is you design something, it doesn't have to be a house, but you design it so that it suits um, a person throughout the range of their life or their, um, life, their life's abilities. Um, and and, and when, we, when we think about that in, in regards to building, um, there's, a, there's a heap of examples of universal design which are already kind of ingrained in our processes. Can anyone think of any examples? Not you, Daniel. You probably can think of lots. Um, well, I'll just jump in and I had one prepared earlier. Um, well, one is balustrading on, on balconies and stairs. So that is, it's about protecting children and children and drunk people, to be fair, children and drunk people from injury. Um, so if we think about that, it's mandatory over certain heights that are known to cause injury, that you've got to have a certain standard of safety around verandas and stairs. So what are the assumptions that... Um, that underpin that decision for that to become standard practice across this country and many others. What's the main assumption around that? That, well, yes, yes. To avoid accidents for who in particular, which I may have given you a hint. It's really about, it's mostly about children. So it's mostly about, the assumption is that at some stage a child will live in that house or will visit that house. And there's another assumption there, which is that children are valuable and that their safety is important. And so what we've done as a society is go, yeah, that's something that really is not, um, it's likely to cause damage to, too, to, to a lot of children and so we're gonna prevent it. So, but if we think of other examples of, um, of um, universal design which aren't, wide aren't mainstreamed into mainstream practices and planning and housing, what are some of those? Ramps. Ramps is, the, ramps is a massive one, especially in our shire where we've got a lot of hilly areas. Um, bathrooms. Ever been into a bathroom where you're banging your elbow and you're an able-bodied person? Like, there's a lot of that design happening. There's a lot of that practice still happening. Um, I mean, ha yep, still happening to this day. So what's the, under, what's the underlying assumption in having masses of flights of stairs up to the start of a house? that everyone can walk. It's a totally ableist presumption. It, it, the, under, the underpinning assumption is that special people will be in special places. They won't be in that house. They won't even visit that house because they'll be somewhere special. They'll be on the yellow bus. They'll be somewhere else. The other, another assumption is that there aren't that many special people. I'm using that term deliberately not, um, not to be offensive. Um, but there's not many special people. Like... You know, we haven't seen anyone roll in here today with a mobility device. There's not that many, okay? It's not a big issue. And the third assumption that's really important is that people with disability aren't valuable um, and that their safety is and is important. And that's something that's really hard to swallow, but it's true. We've lived a life, all our lives, in this soup of considering one of the least valuable people in our communities are people with disability. So... Well, we might just, before we come back to those assumptions, and I'm, and I'm going to counter those assumptions in case you're feeling anxious right at this point, um, just let's look at some practical um, examples. Okay, so there's some balustrading. No child shall drown easily at this location. Um, so it's this kind of thing. So universal design is things like how you approach a building. And, and it's not just inside a building, it's, it's how you would use the garden. So there's a, that's a classic example of a Bellingen garden. It's not a Bellingen garden, but it could be, couldn't it? Everything grows so fast. Um, there's a retrofitted ramp. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between retrofitted and universal design later, but you can see that's a retrofitted ramp, can't you? <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite an obvious um, afterthought. Um, there's one that's been designed from the start. Um, here's my daughter in our tiny house trying to fit her new wheelchair into our tiny bathroom. Um, so this is, one of the, this is one of the key features of universal design is considering your doorway widths, whether it's your front door or the, all the internal doors. Um, and you might not notice that much difference in doorways unless you've tried to use mobility equipment. Um, she's in a paediatric chair, that's her second size, so she's got, she'll be in an adult chair next um, in six years or so. Um, so that's not even an adult chair and that's a manual wheelchair, so power wheelchairs have a much bigger footprint. And she, her knuckles are scraping to go into the bathroom. Once she's in there, we do this kind of thing to, to actually use any of the equipment in the bathroom. Um, so universal design is about um, um, not... It's not necessarily about having everything ready to go for the worst case scenario of mobility equipment, it, but it's about having the ability to adapt to that with the least expense um, later on. So, um, yeah, I... We live in a one-bedroom house. We're doing our bit for the small bedroom, um, the small bedroom model in Bellingen. But but there's you know that with with two children and a service dog and mobility equipment, a one-bedroom house is really really impractical. Um, so that's why I'm here talking about universal design and how important it is. It's not just the number of bedrooms. It's actually what we're building. Um, there's a bathroom that doesn't have all the features that someone would need, but you've certainly got the room to apply any of those features. Um, there's a whole lot of things, like even the way you use taps, and I know that some, I can, I can notice that some people in the room are getting older. Um, the way that taps work, um, those older taps are really hard, get harder and harder and harder. So, um, you know, you can just see there's little like subtle things you do around light switches and um, the tap choices and the height and door and handles of cupboards and things that make a difference. Um, of course, mobility isn't the only disability and... Um, that's a giant light switch, which is just easier to use with all kinds of hand function. Um, but there's also things around lighting. A lot of people have reduced vision, especially as they get older. There's all kinds of different um, vision um, codes now around what different parts of your house should look like. Um, but there's also a whole range of other things, um, other other kinds of disability that do that do ha your housing does have a big impact on. And I've just put sensory processing. Um, slide up there generally but um, you know there's a whole lot of things around your space that because your home is your sanctuary and it's the place you recharge and then you go out into the world when you're living in a really sensory world if your home doesn't provide you that rest and relaxation and that space to recharge that's a huge challenge for those people you know for those people and they set out in the world at, at, at you know behind the eight ball compared to everyone else um, since I'm standing on a um uh, I don't even know what you call this anymore, but a platform, a stage in a church. I thought I'd mention um, there's a, a the, one of the world's most successful evangel evangelical preachers, it, it, Nick Vujicic, has is a man born without arms and legs, and um, he he tours and does stadium shows. He does he's hugely successful um, at his job, and. Um, he says that when he's at home, he doesn't require... A, he doesn't use a support person. He doesn't hire someone to help him. He can use his own home. He can toilet and shower and do all of that stuff at home. He's fine. Um, but when he travels, the energy required for him to perform and do his big shows, stadium shows, he needs help because that energy needs to transfer into something else. And I often think of that statement because what we do as human beings is we adapt and... We survive, but it doesn't mean it's not costing us every bit of energy that we have just to be in the world today. And that's something to, really important to remember. And the point that I made earlier about how you often won't hear from people with disability in consultations is, of course, they're bloody busy most of the time um, get, getting on with it. Uh, why is it important? So to come back to those three, assumption er, uh, three assumptions earlier that sp um, special people are in special places or they belong in special places. Um, History has shown actually people aren't particularly safe in segregated environments. Um, and that's a really sad truth and we're seeing all the inquiries into both aged care and disability care right now um, that, that that's starting to become 
more prominent, but the truth is that that's, that's been the case ever since their inception. The idea of putting vulnerable people in groups and hiding them away from everyone else, um, when you think about it, is a really bad idea. Um, so uh, the second assumption was around not many people. So uh, how, do you think there's about 60 people in the room? Is that about right? So if you could all stand up there, just that from Daniel. So that would, that's actually the representation in this room of number of people who live with disability. So that's um, one in five in Australia and that's pretty consistent across the world. Um, you're going to stay there, if that's okay, if everyone's capable of doing that. You're going to stay there for a little while for a reason that hopefully I remember and don't forget that you're standing there, <laughs> which is possible. Um, so, the, so the idea that there's not many is not true. It's more that they've been less visible for a number of factors. And part of it is not having stable homes <laughs> um, and the energy to go out into the world and be as visible because it does take a lot of energy. Um, you can also add carers to that one in five stat and it brings it up to one in four in Australia. So you can add more, you can add to a quarter of the room, you could add some on um, of people who are directly impacted by disability in Australia. Um, so that idea that there's not many people, you know, who, who are impacted is, is not true. Um, you're still staying there and I'm trying to remember what the reason was. <laughs> Um, so the third assumption was that people with disability, this is the reason I'm getting to it. The third assumption was that people with disability aren't as, val as, aren't as valuable, aren't as valuable members of society or, or, or aren't as valuable as everyone who are producing something. Um, firstly, we, we don't live in a charity model of society anymore. Like um, this, this guy, Jesus, did a whole lot of work to save people from disability at that time with his work around... Um, you know, pity these people, <laughs> pity these people don't cast them out, pity them and look after them. But the charity model only got people with disability so far and right now we've moved out of that and we're into a rights model. So people with disability actually have a right to be everywhere. And as the intro suggested, we're not really ready for that at all in a practical sense. Um, so... Of course, people with disability are valuable. Of course, you are valuable. How are you feeling standing up there by yourselves at the moment? Yeah, okay, That's ten hours later you won't be feeling as good. <laughs> um, so I guess the point to remember is that people with disability have been here since the dawn of human time and they'll be here right at the end as well, despite our best efforts. You know, over 95% of people of positive tests for Down syndrome in Australia end in abortion. So we don't even know who all those people are going to be, but, you know, they're a part of our diversity. Um, so not going away, becoming more of a rights-based movement. Um, you could sit down now. Thank you, one in five. <laughs> um, and I think the big lesson of the rights movement and of all we've seen through charity has been that um, it's actually, it's a segregated life is not the best life you can have. The best life you can have is one that's in community. And to be in community, you actually need to um, do all the things that everyone else does. And actually, most people with disability, that's exactly what they want and that's exactly what they do. Am I close to time? Oh. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Hallelujah. Um, the, other, the other reason, oh, I haven't done that at all. I'll just go down here, okay. So the other thing is, boom, we don't just have people with disability from the standard pathways, we've got the baby boomers and here they come. Here they come in huge numbers. Um, and I'll just, I might talk about that in a minute. Um, the rights movement I already covered. And the last one is there's cost efficiencies. If you design something at the beginning of the constructing a building, um, it's anything from not much and some would even suggest zero compared to retrofitting later. Um, I would question the zero one myself having just paid $1,100 for some handrails a few weeks back. Um, but there's a huge, it's an off the scale difference to retrofit a building. So if you think about it, we've got a few builders here. It's a famous builder of tiny home fame. How easy is it to put a sliding door and cavity inside a wall that wasn't designed for it? Not easy, no. 
So that's only one, and that's only one issue. If you think about maintaining heritage values in a retrofit, you know, not smaller buildings, it's really hard. Big buildings, sometimes they do a great job, like Sydney Museum, the Natural History Museum, they did a great job. Um, but it's hard on smaller scale buildings. Think about the legals. You're actually legally required to provide for people with disability unless you can prove extreme hardship, um, which sometimes companies manage to do. Um, and kitchens and bathrooms, they're the most expensive part of any build. Um, retrofitting them is a really impractical way forward. Um, so how do we get accessible housing? I think we've, um, we've talked heaps about all of that. There's all these tools that we've got. Um, we need to be using them, I guess. And it's, you know, the, un the design stuff is there. The, the, the ways to do things are there, the technology's there, the technology's amazing, the things that can be done now um, that weren't possible in the past. You know, in the past, your main, your main innovations that you could do around disability were around people power and, you know, things with wood. We've come a long way since then. We really have come a long way. Um, I think that universal designs in varying degrees on local councils' agendas, I know we've... Um, in Bellingen Council, we've we've introduced that as part of the development control plan that the universe, that you've got to you've got to aim for a certain standard of universal design, and you'd think that that's you know it's a bit of a given, you know yeah no you're right we should start building more stock that are, is accessible to everyone, but you'd be surprised at the kickback you get from that and. Um, yeah, it's not a given. It's actually a big change. It's a big change that your home is your castle and you should be able to build it how you bloody well please um, because it's yours. Um, I think we also have talked a, bit, a fair bit about um, public investment and we had both Labor and the Greens talking about 500 new homes and big chunks of those being accessible homes um, in the last election. So we won't be seeing those anytime soon. Um, and the third thing is, I think this is a really important one because this is something that's not about governments but it's about everyone in the room, um, is, is that we have, and, and there's been, allu been alluded to, that we actually need private investment, not just someone with extra money to invest, but we all need to start investing in that cultural change and we need to start investing in the changes that are in our own homes. Um, whether that's a really small thing, like when your tap goes, don't replace it with one of those, get one of those, do it now. Like, start doing it now, because um, I guess we have to work with what we have. We have to work with our common spaces. We have to work collectively on our common spaces. Um, but we also have to work with the urgency that it might be you that needs those modifications, and it might be any day. So to assume that you've got 20 years to get your house accessible for your old age is, is, um, is not always a safe assumption to make. Um, yeah, I hear lots of... Funnily enough, I hear lots of complaints about the things that the work that I've done through council and with council about accessibility um, from older people. And I, I've honestly started saying something that goes a little bit like, how old are you now? And if they say 70, I say, come back and talk to me in 10 years because I don't think you'll have the same view. I don't think you'll be, you know, really attached to a gravel path when you can't walk on it anymore. I don't think you'll feel the same way. Um, I think ableism is most prevalent in older generations because older generations lived in a fully segregated world, really. They really did. Give or take, country areas were sometimes a bit different. Um, you know, younger, younger generations are much more likely to have known people with other kids with disability in their playgrounds, in their preschool, in all their sport. You know, it's, there's a different world out there now with younger, with younger people. Um, they're much more likely to, um, to get that. Um, so just remember that, that disability is the only group that anyone can join any time. There's no other club in the world that has that boast. So it doesn't matter what your age is or your income or your race or where you live in the world, actually you could leave here today and you could join that club. So you, you, um, one, you one in five over here, what you have to think about is would you want to be living together in a home you don't know each other, but you all need a sort of a ramp and stuff, so we'll put you together. That's, that's cool. And, um, you know, someone else will hold your front door key. That cool? Yep. And disinfectant. You need lots of disinfectant suddenly in your life. All through your house, your bedrooms. You don't want carpet. Unhygienic. So that's your lot now. Um, am I going massively over time? 
Okay. Um, so just quickly, I might get you lot. Can you guys stand up again for a minute? So I might get you lot who don't identify as having disability. Can I get a couple of representatives, maybe you two? So let's go to the... Um, in 2013, which was the first time in the world there was an estimate of how many people with disability there were in the world, because that's how important it is to everyone to know, it was 2013, um, all that time ago, the OECD countries, they did their index of well-being, that kind of stuff they do, I can't remember the exact term, they ranked people, um, they ranked their, the OECD countries in terms of their you know, indice, it was indice, it was well-being. It was indices like education and environment and all of those kind of healthcare and stuff. So I'd like you to, as representatives of the able-bodied community, to um, to rank Australia. If over there is number one in the world of in the, of the OECD countries, and over here was I think it was 36 at the time. I think there's a few more countries now. Could you stand where on that spectrum you think Australia stood? In 2013. To be fair, we've had the NDIS since then. There's 10% of people have got a slightly better life and a lot more paperwork. So you're standing in the middle. Okay, we might get... Can we have some representatives who haven't seen this? No Rose, no Dom. Um, can we have some representatives to come and represent your... When, we, when, uh, when they isolated out people with disability in Australia at the same time, where do you think their standard of living sat in Australia, was it was it closer to number one or was it closer to number 36? About there? Oh, number one, best in the world? Of worst, yeah. So it's interesting how you clump, clump for safety, you're not safe. Um, okay, so, so the able-bodied community, Australia ranked number one, so go right up to there. You did, yeah. Number one in the world, high, really high. St we have a really high standard of living, even despite squandering mining booms and so on. We have we have a really high standard of living. So people with disability, when isolated out, we ranked 36 right to the end. So I just want to leave you with that challenge that you know the NDIS is rolling out and there's been some big changes, but there's actually a lot of changes that need to happen here in everyone's minds and the way we do what we do is a really important thing to stop this continuing because this is not okay. <laughs> and a big part of it is these people being able to come into everyone's home, not just their own and not their group home. Who did have the key anyway? And, <laughs> you know, who's buying the disinfectant this week? Um, so remember, anyone could join that group today, tomorrow, next week, your grandchild, your child... Um, anyone you know and love yourself, that can be your life. Um, thank you very much, volunteers. Please do sit down. Um, so I'd like to leave you with the thought that if you did require a significant reduction in your mobility, and let's just think about mobility for the moment, um, what, what, would it, what would the business of being you look like? How different would that be? Would you be able to be um, in your job? Would you be able to get in and out of your home? Would you be able to use your bathroom? Um, all your activities, your children's... Can you access your child's school? Can you access your child's activities that they do, their extracurricular activities? Um, you know, can you get in and out of your friends' houses? Can you get in and out of your favourite coffee shop? Can you use the bathroom there? Do they even have a bathroom there? Um, so have a think about that because if you answered no to any of those things, you'll realise why we need universal design and we need it now because... Um, the baby boomers are now rolling into that age where when the proportions and ratios we've used to assess what we need in terms of parking and public things is about to blow out of the water and we're totally unprepared. Um, so I'll leave you with that positive thought. Thank you. <laughs>